Kimmer High, Hulu Dunya, Fauci Goo, Ye Old Scots, The Celtic Podcast. On today's show, we'll introduce you to um, so future tense of questions and some helpful vocabulary in Fekimich Beck and Gaelic. We'll talk about Summerled, the progenitor of the Clan Donald, in our Celtic history segment. And I'll talk to you also about hog many and first footing in everyday Celtic ways, because the new year is coming up. Today we'll hear music from Rachel Sermani. We'll hear two different tracks from Steve McDonald, who will be the um, subject of our Celtic music spotlight, and Julie Fallis. And as always, a wee bit of Irish trivia to test your knowledge to start us off. Who established the Christmas tree as a counterpoint to the Catholic nativity scene? All right. Now remember, learngallic.net. It's a great resource for your Gallic learning. And duolingo.com. I'm really starting to like this thing. It's uh, You don't really realize it at first when you're playing it. It's kind of like a game. But it's actually starting to help me out a little bit. And listening to the native speakers speak has helped me with some of my pronunciation. So it's, it's good all around. So try out the Duolingo. Um, I think the other day I noticed on Facebook that we hit 100,000 people trying to learn it. That's cool. And anybody within the St. Louis area that would like to be a part of a weekly Scottish Gaelic class, first of all, you should be a member of the Scottish Gaelic, um, St. Louis Gaelic Facebook page. And there you'll find out about everything that's going on locally. And if you don't, you can just ask me. Just shoot me a comment. Um, I'll get you any details about anything you need. So, Kirsh Maha, let's kick this thing off. Enjoy. Good Amish half of the ends, medium he the throne. Fat of hat of am harsh, and all the mat ye the post. Gus and fach the stavatel, a shuliast the dos. Chin is jach and a harsh, just mach an art man ye the stock. Mach an art man ye the shoe, the chin ye use in throat. Gubbling cool was a big. Smooth get him a sweat. Hat a laugh so hogly so snach the reeky shed nyerst. Get a hikuk muth do got him who the scoot of the shell. Sket a veal kiss, snuck a mad on wool a battle a crown. Who the you see is lahti. So loy a haster no long. Vigi ay ganagut ram giri etar kaglaw. Smooth bulag madarag fuas klagereng an slaw. Batu skipers na farag ya batu fer falam matet green. Kartu pudding ya shoe the gnua the ulta gati. Get the vidig yet had his shit no lawyers and doom. to see Hogado, Gus and Taragichi. Wow. 
Falling, see falling, see the guy who won. Ira ho chi da re di sayet, skug na hai ko kruy. Get the big star ma ho ha mi awan yau zeng ka ga tu. Ni fer hai shke da gal lab na ha ron stu. Ha fer hai shke da chin ba tu kiao nu yen kiet ba tu kiao nu yen a ku jiao zha ba skru ba da kiem. Now my rain don't fall a shell, man. Cut off my dream. But you make me feel alive, but I'm not so clear. All right, that was Oren Firth Hesker. By Julie Fallis. And now, I'm Tom and Fekovich back in Gaelic. Well, it's time for Let's Try a Little Gaelic. Now, I need to say this as I have in past podcasts that I am, and do I, 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 I am not, and do I represent myself as an authority on the Gaelic language, only someone who loves learning it and who wants to help other students in their journey of learning Gaelic. What I teach comes right from textbooks of well-respected Gaelic teachers. I am just trying to make something interesting, informative, and fun, which can help others learn and have fun as well. Today we will discuss the future tense, questions, and some helpful vocabulary. And as always, I'll display what I'm talking about on the screen, so you can see what we're, we're discussing. Toshik Shin, let's begin. All right. Questions in the future tense use a special form of the future called the relative future. Now, as you progress in your Gallic learning, you will find out more. Um, just remember for now to use this form with the future tense questions called the relative future. All right. So, we're going to have J. Fius. What will something be when you fierce when will something be her son obvious why will something be hammer obvious how will something be covet vs how many will something be and of course catch and be where will something be catch always has to be different it's the red-headed stepchild of the bunch. All right, some vocabulary words. Now, that's actually pretty simple as far as the question part of the, uh, the future tense. And as you see, they follow the same form as, as past tense and present tense. So it's, it's pretty simple. Um, you know, self-explanatory um, how you do your future tense questions for now. It gets a little more complicated later on as you advance. Um, like I said, vocabulary words. All right. Chunik, meet. A chunikhu, meeting. A chunyv, a meeting. Cheskich, teach. A chesik, teaching. Yansik, learn. Achyansikik, learning. Kul or kulav, back or behind. Erkul, behind. Erkul and Doris, behind the door. Ermohul, behind me. Erdohul, behind you. Erkul Mari. Behind Mary. Shuit. Go on. Shuitive. Go on. Plural. That means for more than one person. Ro. This two. Rohe. <clears throat> Sorry. Rohe. Too hot. Rohada. Too long. 
skewer, stop, skewer, yay, stop it. Jerk, straight, it also means just. So, jerk minute, just a minute, or jerk green, just a bite. Alright, na, it means don't. Na ich, don't eat. Na ol, don't drink. The dunya sambi, anyone. Chanel le dunya sambi, not with anyone. Surye, dating. Chanel me surye le dunya sambi. I'm not dating anyone. Chat sambi, any cat. Root thing. Root sambi, anything. Rootigan, something. Kujikin, somebody. Eacher, at all. Now that's a very, very widely used uh, word right there, eacher. Gav, or a gavel, take or taking. Gian, or a geniv. Do, doing, or make, or making. Could be either one. Gav Maleshkel. Excuse me. Literally, take my excuse. Jock. Drink. Ha and jock air. The drink is on him, or it means he's drunk. Ha and jock air Rory. The drink is on Rory. It means Rory's drunk. Poor Rory. Gashalig. Gashalig. Gia Orscht. Bless you. That's what you would say for somebody who sneezes. Literally, it's God will look upon you. Which is a nice little blessing. I don't know why you'd waste it on somebody just sneezing, but apparently that's the tradition. Na tov me goose and chut me. Don't lift me until I fall. Hmm. It's apparently that's an old Gallic saying. Now be, now be Jew and Jay. If only today was yesterday. Oh wow. Vakujikin er mohul. Somebody was behind me. Karo and Jack er ulum eacher. William was not drunk at all. Jaya, aha dovein a Janev. What is your wife doing? Nakro dunya sambi adol ansut. Wasn't anyone going yonder? Hmm. Alright. That's enough vocabulary for today, but there's some good ones in there. I like those. There's some kind of odd ones, but they're ones that you would use in uh, everyday conversation. Alright. I got six here. I want you to try to translate into English. Number one. Chanel dunya sambi adola makanish. Ak halar mor ansho. Number two, Gav Maleshkel, Avel Dunya Sambi Ado Amak. Alright, three, Kacha Ambi, An Haley An Ath Bliana. Four, Koviet Kura Avias Ak Ichia. Five, Bi Mi Ageri An Lar An Ath Shakten. Six, be an Antakras Orum. All right. And that's it for today's Fekimich Beck and Gaelic. I hope you enjoyed it. Enjoy the music.
sword from hill to lock and dark fjord, battling till his life he shed, leaving the throne to the sons of Summerland. That was Sons of Summerlit by Steve McDonald. And he's our focus in the Celtic Music Spotlight. Steve McDonald, he was born in September of 1950. He is from New Zealand. He's a composer, singer, and instrumentalist who performs in the Celtic fusion musical style. He performed in rock bands Timberjack and Dizzy Limits and Human Instinct. I have never heard of them, but oh well. Before embarking on a solo career, he has composed. Oh, he did. He did rock bands before he embarked on his solo career. I'm sorry, it's kind of some uh, bad grammar in there. Got me all mixed up. Um, he 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 has composed musical scores for television shows and documentaries. Beginning in the early 1990s, McDonald has explored his Scottish heritage through a series of Celtic recordings and they are six different CDs here um, Sons of Summerled, The Stone of Destiny, Winter in Scotland, A Highland Christmas, The Message from Steve McDonald and The Highland Farewell and Legend. Well, he's been busy. Alright, that's it for the Celtic Spotlight. Next, we're going to delve into the rich history that is our Celtic past. Alright, today's Celtic history break is about Summerled, the progenitor, the beginner, the person that began the Clan Donald. And of course, he didn't have a clue what he was doing back then. He was just doing what anybody does. But Summerled um, was born in and about 1113 in Morvern. His father was Gildebride MacGilly Adominan, a descendant of a noble Gallic family who were probably an offshoot of the House of Alpin at the time Kenneth I combined Dalreda and the Picts. Similad's mother was of Norse descent. Similad's grandfather, Gildan Dominan, of the Isles had been defeated by the Norse and exiled to Ireland when he was a child. Summerled's more immediate family was also expelled from their home and sent to Ireland. His father, Gillibrad, raised an army of 500 and returned to Morvern to regain their lands, but was beaten off and killed. Ooh, man, not good. Much of Summerled's youth was spent on the margins of life in his native land, but sometime around 1135, he became the leader of a rebellion against the, Nor the Norse control. He successfully cleared Morvern, Lochaber, and the northern part of Argyle from Norse influence, and became known as the Thane of Argyle, possibly with the formal endorsement of David I of Scotland, who would have been grateful to see the Norse tide turn back in at least one part of Scotland in 1140. A summer lad extended his area of influence by marrying Rag... Ooh, goodness. Ragnahilda, daughter of Olaf the Red. Olaf the Red... Um, Godwardson. All right, Olaf the Red, the Norse king of man, whose territory included the Hebrides, they had three sons. Dougal, Ragnall, and Angus. The summer lad also had one son by a previous marriage, Gilakulum. Shortly afterwards, though, summer lad helped suppress an uprising against Olaf the Red. And in 1143, Olaf the Red was murdered by his sons of his brother Harold, but was succeeded as King of Man by his son and summer lad's brother in law. Um, Ochre God, uh, Godred II, the Black Olafson, or Godfrey the Black. Wow. 
Godfrey ruled with a heavy hand and was deeply unpopular. And in 1155, there was an uprising against him, and this time, Summerled backed it. Summerled's involvement proved decisive. He uh, used a fleet of galleys fitted with rudders, which was the latest in naval technology. Summerled is... Um, he's said to have invented the rudder, the one that fits in the very back, center back, to help guide the ship better than in the past, where what they did was they just uh, tied a uh, board to the starboard side. That's what it means, starboard. That side of the ship, they would just strap a board to it and then move the board back and forth to get some kind of steering. Well, he affixed an actual rudder in the center in the back, which gave him a lot more mobility made him more manu more maneuverable in sea battles, giving him the upper hand. So, he defeated Godfrey at the Battle of Epiphany, probably off of the coast of Islay, on the 5th or 6th of January in 1156, and then he declared himself Re-Ensgal, or King of the Isles. Now, what Summerlin had achieved was to introduce a third force into the long-standing conflict between the kings of Scotland and the kings of Norway over the ownership of the Hebrides. While the title Re and Skull dated back centuries before Olaf the Red, all its holders up to Godfrey the Black owed allegiance to the king of Norway. In contrast, Summerled's kingdom of the Isles was not a subservient kingdom to the king of Norway, it was a separate kingdom, independent of both Norway and Scotland. The newly powerful Summerled was seen as a serious threat by King Malcolm IV of Scotland, and in 1160 the two met in an indecisive battle in Argyll. After an uneasy peace, conflict was resumed in early 1164. Summerled landed an army of 15,000 men from 164 galleys at Greenock. He intended to capture Renfrew, but somewhere near Inchin, Close to the site of today's Glasgow airport, Summerled was intercepted by forces under Walter Fitzalan, High Steward of Scotland. Now, Summerled betrayed and was betrayed and killed, allegedly by a nephew in the pay of Malcolm IV. His army returned to their galleys and departed without engaging in a full-scale battle. Accounts differ as to whether Summerled was buried on Iona or at Saddle Abbey. Now, Scott uh, Summerled is credited with breaking the strangle horde of the Norse on the western seaboard and the Isles. There is a certain irony um, in this: is he was himself Norse on his mother's side, and possibly, in part, on his father's side, according to DNA studies, and he had married into the family of Olaf the Red. The independent kingdom he had briefly created was not. To outlive him, though, but Summerled had changed things for good. After his death, Summerled's kingdom of the Isles was divided amongst his three sons from his marriage to Ragnall. The descendants of Angus went on to form the clan McRory. The descendants of Dougal went on to form the clan McDougal. And the descendants of Ragnall's son Donald Donald Moore McRandall would become the Clan Donald, who went on to found the Lordship of the Isles. As mentioned earlier, upon his death, Summerled's kingdom was divided between three sons, each of which would form their own clans, the most notable of which to emerge from this period was Clan Donald. Angus Moore MacDonald, grandson of Summerled, was present at a key event that would be the turning point in the history of the islands. The Battle of Largs in 1263 saw the effective end of Norse influence in Scottish affairs once and for all. Angus fought for the King Hekon of Norway against Alexander III, King of the Scots. Defeat in the battle saw Angus change allegiance. Agents Angus kept his lands, though, but now they held their titles under the overlord of the King of Scots. 
for people who saw themselves as direct descendants of the great Summerled, an independent king in his own right, this was always going to be an uneasy alliance. The Scottish king wanted to tighten his grip on the islands, while the Macdonalds wanted to strengthen their land claims on the mainland. And then later on, for supporting Robert de Bruce in the War of Independence, the Macdonalds were granted even more territory on the mainland, including Lochaber and Glencoe. Further territories such as Skye and Lewis were granted when John of Islay supported Edward Balliol, son of John Balliol, in his attempts to seize the throne of Scotland in the 1330s. These further grants saw the appearance of an important new title used. John of Islay wrote to the King of England, Edward III, to seek confirmation of his right to the newly granted territories, and he signed the letter Dominus Insularium, or Lord of the Isles. Now, the headquarters for the lordship was unusual but highly symbolic. An island within an island. A small island in Loch Finlagen on the island of Inslay was chosen as the administrative center for the disparate islands and clans that owned allegiance to the mighty Macdonalds. It was at this point that the clan began to consolidate its power under a new title, Lord of the Isles. Territories were consolidated, people, warriors, ships, and influence. At this point, the lordship became even more important than the clan. But clan was still important. John of Islay, or John, Lord of the Isles, was clever. He demanded fealty, but didn't force anyone into his own clan. Instead, he gathered them together in a clan association with ancestry to Summerled, the thread that sewn them together. This would eventually make them the most powerful clan in Scotland, and even threaten the Scottish king for power. Summerled's influence is still felt today. Widespread DNA studies suggest that as many as 800,000 people living today are descended from Summerled. This is a number only bettered by Genghis Khan, who, again according to DNA studies, is estimated to be the ancestor of 16 million people alive today. Wow. So you can see how one man can make a difference. Summerled and his descendants created the McDonald's, who later became the Lord of the Isles and one of the most powerful clans in Scotland. That's cool. It makes me proud to be a McDonald. All right.
of the Isles by Steve McDonald. And now it's time for Everyday Celtic Ways, a look into how our Celtic heritage is still very much a part of our everyday lives. Today we're going to tell you about hogmany and first footing. Um, hogmany is the Scots word for the last day of the year and is synonymous with the celebration of the year on the Gregorian calendar and in the Scottish manner. It is normally followed by further celebration on the morning of New Year's Eve, or I'm sorry, New Year's Day, or in some cases even to the 2nd of January, which is a Scottish bank holiday. So, the origins of Hogmany are unclear, but it may be derived from Norse and Gaelic observations. Customs vary throughout Scotland and usually include gift-giving and visiting the homes of friends and neighbors with special attention given to the first foot. Now, the fir that's the first guest of the new year. Now, while Hogmany is just a party to bring in the new year, first footing is a tradition which is essentially a Celtic house blessing. In Scottish and Northern English folklore, the first foot, also known in Manx Gaelic as Quata or Quata, is the first person to enter the home of a household on New Year's Day and is seen as the bringer of good fortune for the coming new year. Although it is acceptable in many places for the first foot to be a resident of the house, they, they must not be in the house at the stroke of midnight in order to be the first foot. Thus, going out of the house after midnight and then coming back in is not considered to be first footing. So, the first foot in Scottish tradition is the first person to enter the home of the household on New Year's Eve, I'm sorry, on New Year's Day, and is seen as the bringer of good fortune for the coming year. Although, it is acceptable in many places for the first... I just said that. Well, it's not mandatory. It is said to be desirable, even lucky, for the first foot to be a tall, dark-haired, or aged male. The first foot usually brings several gifts, perhaps including a coin for security, bread for food, salt for the flavor of life, coal for the warmth, and some kind of evergreen for long life. And a good drink, good cheer, for good cheer. So, and that's usually whiskey. So, this new year, do something different other than just drinking and partying to the wee hours of the morning. Make up some baskets of goodies and be that bringer of good luck for your friends and family. Be their first foot of the year and let them know of a cool Scottish tradition. I plan to make uh, little baskets with a, a dollar, probably a dollar coin, a small loaf of bread or pastry, some salt, 
some hand warmers, and a Bible verse. And, of course, a drink. Whiskey preferable. One of those little bottles. So I uh, shouldn't offend the teetotalers. And a small card explaining all about the first footing. I think that'll be kind of cute. Alright. That's it for Everyday Celtic Ways. Alright. That's it for today's show. I hope you liked it. I'm trying to keep it interesting, informative, and fun. For me, anytime you can infuse something Celtic in your day, it's a good day. I'd like to thank you for all the support and kind words. Um, from all the views and subscribers I've gotten recently, you seem to like what I'm doing. So, there you go. I appreciate it. Now, before I let you go, the trivia question. All right. The first Christmas crib, or nativity scene, was made by in Assisi by St. Francis, St. Francis of Assisi, to celebrate Christ Mass, or what would become Christmas. When Martin Luther penned his 95 Thesis and created the Protestant movement, he used a Christmas tree, a Norwegian fir, to symbolize what the nativity had. He tried to distance himself from the Catholic traditions and ceremony. Now, what ties this to Ireland is that he did this on the suggestion of an Irish monk, who he had confided in during his time of rebellion against the Catholic Church. Now, that was a cute little piece of trivia I found. All right, remember to check out Duolingo.com, LearnGallic.net, ACGAmerica.org, and, of course, my YouTube channel, Ye Old Scott. And we appreciate it. All right. Martian Levin draws up. Bye for now. I'm going to let you go with a song by Rachel Sermani, A Fond Kiss. Enjoy. A fond kiss and then we sever if we will last forever Deep in heart drunk tears I'll pledge thee Warring sighs and groans I'll wage thee shall say that fortune grieves him while the star of hope she leaves him mean a cheerful twinkle lights me dark despair around the night me Kindly, had we never loved, say blindly, never met or never parted, we'd have never been broken hearted. Nothing could resist my Nancy For to see her was to love her Love but her and love forever
peace, enjoyment, love and pleasure. If on kiss her, then we sever. If we relax forever, deep in heart, drunk tears I'll pledge thee. Warring sighs and groans I'll wage thee.